While the atrocities committed by high-ranking Nazi officials during World War II are widely known and documented, the lives of their wives after the war have often been overlooked. These women were married to some of the most notorious figures in history, but what happened to them once the war was over? Were they held accountable for the actions of their husbands, or were they able to live a peaceful life? Let's take a look at the post-war experiences of Nazi wives and the impact it had on their lives. Ilse Hess Ilse Hess led a life marked by her unwavering allegiance to the Nazi party and her marriage to Rudolf Hess, Adolf Hitler's deputy. She became Rudolf Hess's steadfast companion, standing by his side through the turbulent years of the Third Reich. Ilse and Rudolf Hess met in the early 1920s, and their relationship blossomed amidst the rising tide of National Socialism. In 1921, she initially joined the Nazi Party, and then rejoined in 1925, after the party had been banned. She was initially attracted to Rudolf Hess, but he hesitated to pursue a relationship. Ilse introduced Hess to Adolf Hitler, who actively engaged in social events hosted by affluent women. Hitler played a significant role in facilitating and influencing the marriage between Ilse and Hess, which occurred on December 20, 1927, in Munich. Moreover, Hitler stood as the godfather to their only child, Wolf Hess, born in 1937. Throughout the war, Ilse remained a steadfast supporter of the Nazi regime. Her loyalty was most evident when her husband embarked on a solo flight to Scotland, a futile attempt to negotiate peace with the United Kingdom. Despite the repercussions of his ill-fated mission, Ilse staunchly defended his intentions and continued to stand by the party. Ilse Hess's life after the war was marked by the challenges of rebuilding and adapting to a world that had irrevocably changed. With her husband sentenced to life imprisonment during the Nuremberg trials, she was left to raise their son alone. After World War II, Ilse Hess and some other wives of high-ranking Nazis who were either convicted or executed in the Nuremberg trials got arrested. They shipped her off to an internment camp in Augsburg. When they let her go, she moved to Algau and opened a boarding house by 1955. Ilse Hess was a steadfast believer in National Socialism and remained devoted to Adolf Hitler and his ideologies until her demise. Post-war, she provided support to Still Hilfer, a silent organization for arrested, condemned, and fugitive SS members. Her controversial book, England Nuremberg Spandau, Ein Schicksal in Briefen, published in 1952, gained some attention. Among her correspondents were known admirers of Hitler. Her later years were spent advocating for her husband's release from Spandau prison, where he was held until his death in 1987. Ilse Hess passed away on September 7, 1995, leaving behind a complex legacy intertwined with the troubled history of Nazi Germany. Marguerite Himmler Marguerite Himmler was the wife of Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler. In a twist of irony, Marguerite Himmler was initially trained as a nurse with the noble intention of saving lives in World War I. After the war, she transitioned to the German Red Cross Hospital, and with her father's financial support, she even managed a private nursing clinic. Marguerite first crossed paths with Heinrich during one of his lecture tours in 1927. His attraction to her was immediate, captivated by her blue eyes and blonde hair. They married in July the following year. Despite Heinrich's initial apprehension about introducing Marguerite to his Catholic family, due to their age difference and her previous marriage, as well as her Protestant faith. Eventually, his family grudgingly accepted Marguerite. The couple welcomed their daughter Gudrun into the world on August 8, 1929. Marguerite was far from a passive spectator in her husband's activities. She became a member of the Nazi party in 1928 and regularly arranged gatherings for the spouses of high-ranking SS leaders. Despite her involvement, she was notably unpopular during the Nuremberg Rally in 1938, she had disagreements with the other women, who collectively refused to follow her lead. By the end of 1939, Marguerite was overseeing the operation of Red Cross hospitals throughout Berlin-Brandenburg. Her role sent her on missions to countries and regions under German Wehrmacht occupation. In her diary, there is a noted trip to Poland, which was under German occupation at the time, in March 1940. Confirming her eyewitness account of the events unfolding there, Marguerite wrote, then I was in Posen, Lodz, Warsaw. This Jewish rabble, Polacks, most of them don't look like human beings and the dirt is indescribable. It's an incredible job trying to create order there. 
Due to her efforts, Himmler achieved the rank of colonel within the German Red Cross. In February 1945, Marguerite wrote to Gebhard Himmler, Heinrich Himmler's brother, expressing her thoughts on Heinrich. How wonderful that he has been called to great tasks and is equal to them. The whole of Germany is looking to him. In April 1945, Marguerite and Heinrich Himmler shared a final moment before his death. Their marriage had effectively ended years before, with Marguerite discovering in 1941 that Heinrich was secretly entangled with his secretary, with whom he had two children. When the war concluded, Marguerite was subjected to numerous investigations probing the extent of her knowledge regarding her husband's affairs. She denied any awareness and pleaded to be cleared of Nazi association, absolving her of her husband's crimes. After a prolonged deliberation, in 1953, she was deemed a profiteer of the Nazi regime and sentenced to 30 days of penal labor. Consequently, she was stripped of her voting rights and pension eligibility. After her release, she lived under the pseudonym Marguerite Bowden until her death in 1967 and tried to distance herself from her past. Lena Heydrich Lena's brother Hans was an ardent member of the Nazi party and the SA. His high praise of the party led Lena to a rally in 1929, where Adolf Hitler delivered a speech that greatly impacted her, prompting Lena to join the Nazi party. It was during a rowing club ball in Kiel at the age of 19 that she met Naval Lieutenant Heydrich, eventually leading to their engagement announcement on December 18, 1930. However, the subsequent year saw Heydrich facing charges of conduct unbecoming to an officer and a gentleman for violating an engagement promise to a woman he had been involved with for six months prior to his engagement to Lena. This led to his dismissal from the Navy in April, leaving him without a career. It was Lena who suggested the possibility of a career in the newly established SS. Heinrich's ideas for an SS intelligence service prompted Heinrich Himmler to immediately appoint him as the new chief of the newly formed intelligence service, known later as the SD. As an acknowledgement of her husband's dedication to the Nazi cause, Hitler gifted Lena with a large estate in rural Bohemia. At the estate, she kept several prisoners for forced labor, where it's alleged she abused them physically. The family resided there until April 1945 when they, along with many other Germans, escaped the closing Soviet Red Army. After World War II, Lena was acquitted in the denazification proceedings. Through a couple of court battles against the West German government in 1956 and 1959, she successfully secured a pension, a contentious decision given her husband's significant role in the Holocaust. Despite her conviction and sentencing to life imprisonment in absentia by Czechoslovakia, she managed to avoid serving the sentence. In 1965, during a vacation to Finland, she met and later married Finnish theatre director Mauno Maninen, a move primarily aimed at changing her surname. She managed her first husband, Reinhard Heydrich's former summer house on Femarn, turning it into a restaurant and inn until an accident caused a fire. In 1976, she wrote a memoir, Life with a War Criminal. She tirelessly defended her first husband's reputation up until her passing at the age of 74 on August 14, 1985. Emmy Göring Emmy Göring married the prominent Luftwaffe chief and Nazi Hermann Göring on April 10, 1935. Interestingly, even though Emmy didn't actively seek membership, she was gifted a Nazi party induction as a Christmas present in 1938. Emmy Göring held the responsibility of being Hitler's hostess at numerous state functions before the start of World War II. Her self-proclaimed status as the First Lady of the Third Reich led to a significant rift with Hitler's would-be wife, Eva Braun, whom Emmy openly disregarded and treated with disdain. This behavior resulted in Hitler demanding Hermann Göring to instruct Emmy to treat Eva with due respect. One consequence of Emmy's disdainful attitude was her exclusion from Hitler's Bavarian retreat, the Berghof. Eva Braun reportedly held a grudge against Emmy for her assumption of being the First Lady of the Reich. Emmy was in a position of significant power and wealth in Europe, and therefore enjoying a lavish lifestyle during World War II. Her husband's ownership of mansions, estates, and castles in Austria, Germany, and Poland garnered from the confiscation of art and wealth from Jews and others classified as enemies by the Nazi regime were testaments to their opulence. Upon their daughter Edda's birth, her husband commanded a tribute of 500 planes to fly over Berlin, stating that he would have doubled the number had it been a boy. 
After the war, a German denazification court found Emmy guilty of being a Nazi, leading to a year-long incarceration. After her release, a portion of her wealth, amounting to 30%, was seized, and she was prohibited from performing on stage for five years. After her time in jail, Emmy Goering managed to get a tiny apartment for herself in Munich. She also wrote an autobiography called My Life with Goering. Emmy passed away in Munich on June 8, 1973. She was 80 years old. Well, that's it. We hope you enjoyed our video. Leave your thoughts in the comments, remember to like and subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more fascinating history content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.